Welcome back to the Rob Skinner Podcast. My goal is to inspire you to make this life count and to multiply disciples, leaders, and churches. Today, I'm thrilled to interview Christian Ray Flores from Austin, Texas. Christian, thank you to, for joining me on the program today. Thank you for having me. Christian, when I was a younger Christian, I, uh, I remember hearing about you because of the, the work that was do, being done in the former USSR. This was the early 90s. Uh, there was a lot of Christian activity going on after the wall broke down. And I remember s- s- vividly some pictures and some video of people up on stage, huge crowds. And I remember them reporting that there was a pop star who became a Christian and he was performing. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. And turns out that was you. And uh, couldn't you tell me a little bit about that time? Such an interesting thing. Well, it was was a crazy time. I was... um sort of, you know, musical since I was a kid, but I studied economics, nothing to do with music because I didn't really see uh, music as an opportunity. And then for some reason, I thought I would try it out. And, and it was just a combination of, you know, good, good music, luck, you know, the a, a sort of a time in the country where what I was doing became popular quickly. So I probably started my career in 93. And you know, by the end of 93, I was on national television. So it was very, very, very fast and national. So by the time I was a, I I became a Christian, it was, uh, I had a number one hit right around that time. So I was at the very peak of my career, literally, and at the very bottom of my personal life. So I was just very depressed uh, in the, on the inside and very, very successful, like flying high on the outside. So it was a very strange paradoxical uh, place to be in. It's it's amazing when I when I think about it. And I don't know of, of very many people that have a more varied background. Uh, you've got a father who's Chilean. You've, your mother is Russian. Uh, you've grown up all over the world. Uh, can you tell me a little bit of back, a little bit about yes, your background? It, I, it's a it's a very strange. Uh, it's uh, I grew up on three continents. Uh, I've lived in on three on. Four four continents and in six countries and three continents and four countries. This is before the age of seven. So it's Russia. I was born in Russia, Chile, um, then Germany, then back to Russia, then Africa, then back to Russia when I was a teenager. So there's this dramatic change in everything, language, culture, everything. My world changed several times before I was, you know, seven, eight years old. I, I learned four languages before the age of nine. That's amazing. So, yeah, so it's very, very unusual. <laughs> now tell me, how did you become a Christian? So you became a pop star. You had a number one hit in Russia. Uh, how did you how did you get met? What led you to Christ? I was, so I was flying high. I, I had a number one hit at the time. Uh, I was everywhere, right? Uh, radio, TV, every, you name it. I was playing to, you know, thousands of people and on to millions on TV. So, and then my, all, all, obviously when you rise so quickly, all of your character flaws, your dysfunctions come, come to the surface very quickly as well. You know, things that get revealed in times of quick change. Right. Um, so I, I became very, you know, disillusioned very quickly. And I think part of it was just reaching the very top and going, okay, I'm as miserable as I was at the bottom. So what's the deal here? You know, <laughs> I felt cheated. <laughs> so, you know, like I thought my romantic life would be like amazing. And, and, and I just, I didn't want, I didn't want to, even as a, as a, before I was a Christian, I really didn't want to be this, you know, man, like, that uses women and things like that. And I ended up being something of that. And, um, you know, because attention from, from, from the female part of the, of the country was, um, was pretty high. And, but I very quickly realized that uh, that's just not who I want to be. It's just terrible. It's just, I felt, I felt bad. I was, and then I had a, I had a serious relationship, which is what sort of you do as a cliche rock star. And, uh, I was dating this, um, this supermodel, like runway model uh, at the time, which is, I thought was you're supposed to be doing as a rock star. Like right. everything, of, I think everything about me was unoriginal. And, uh, <laughs> and, 
and we had a baby together and that changed everything. And all of this, th those dysfunctions that already was carrying around sort of came crashing upon this young sort of relationship. And we, we broke up and she took the kid and she cut me off. And I was just, I, get, I just came to a very, it was very clear to me in HD 3D that I did not know how to do life. You know, so that was sort of that one thing that stuck in my head. Like, I just don't know how to do this. Right. And um, at the time I was this, um, I was actually into new age and Eastern philosophy. And I was, I was actually a vegetarian. I was sitting at a, at a, at this uh, cafe and this one guy keeps staring at me and I was used to being stared at. Uh, but then he followed me into the parking lot. And I'm like, okay, this is not good. This is a stalker. And, you know, and he, this guy basically said, Hey, you know, I know who you are, but uh, I was thinking, I was wondering if, you know, you would want to come to church. And I had a very, very uh, negative view of Christianity at the time, right? And all I knew was really Eastern Orthodox Christianity. I didn't really know anything Protestant, modern, real, authentic. I just didn't have any, any of those experiences. So I was like, no. Um, but we became friends with this guy. So we sort of talked every once in a while and, you know. And I liked him a little bit better. So he, he insisted, hey, come to church with me, come to church with me. And uh, I came. I came in the very first uh, ch uh, Sunday service. I came to a campus. I think it was a, like, some sort of campus worship thing. And uh, I was, you know, prideful, arrogant. I, had, I was wearing shades, sat in the back row. Like everything about me was screaming cliche and I don't want to be around people. And, you know, part of it is actually true. Like you, you, if you're used to attention, you, you don't want to people to stare at you when you come, especially if you come to a new environment like church. So I came and I really liked um, the sermon. Uh, someone was preaching and, the, and it was very real, very bold, you know, it was from the Bible and it was just dealt with real life. And I was like, oh, this is, this is special. You know, um, I hated the worship, the music, as a musician and it was like a bunch of campus students trying to make music you know making a, making a joyful noise which to me sounded more like noise uh and uh, uh but but I, I was able to i think through that see there's something powerful here and i met this guy who actually happened to be the missionary who started the whole thing his name was Andy fleming uh and uh, he came you know and i spoke english and he spoke English and he had no idea who I was at all. Like everybody was pointing and saying, hey, this is Christian. And I was like, who is Christian? I have no idea. You know, so right. which was actually quite, I think is, it was an advantage, right? And he said, hey, let's go out for pizza. So we did and we started talking and that's how it all started, basically. That's, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. So how, what, what brought you, now you're in Austin, Texas. How, boy, long way around, how'd you end up in Austin? Well, I was... When I, after I became a Christian, two years in, I basically gave up my career and went in the ministry. And because um, I felt like my fun, found sort of fundamental, the Holy Spirit, I think, was calling me because I could see that I could entertain uh, a lot of people, but I'm not changing any lives. And I became jealous of the preachers who were changing lives. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I think I can preach like them. <laughs> They're doing, have more impact than I do. Than I do. <laughs> so maybe I can do that, you know, so uh i'm very irrational on that level so um so i was you know i was leading uh churches in moscow and then in kiev for for a bit and um in this whole mix you know i was we were there for a few years i got married i got married to deb my wife i met her, met her in la she was um in the ministry in los angeles and she moved to russia to be with me and we had a couple kids wow. so we have three daughters now oh and, congratulations uh, we but her, she, she had some health issues with the climate, so we had to move to the U.S. So when we moved to the U.S., uh, I worked as a country director for an organization called Hope Worldwide for a while, for about three years. And then I went into ministry. So it was like Philadelphia. So it was Kiev, Philadelphia, Philadelphia, South Florida, South Florida, Los Angeles. And then in Los Angeles, we did ministry. I started a company there, an entertainment company, and I was doing ministry, so I was co-vocational. And bivocational, some people say, and then we went. Then we were like something, like the Holy Spirit. I think was telling me, "I well, go start a church. Mm -hmm. You know, go you do do something from nothing. You know." And I I, I felt very refreshed in, in in the Lord. I went through my midlife crisis in Los Angeles, which is not fun but very necessary. Uh, so I went through my midlife crisis. So some 
darker times of introspection. You have to really go deep to try to recalibrate yourself. And then I emerged from that really refreshed, full of faith and just really excited about life and ministry. So I wanted to go to, I wanted to go somewhere and start something. I was so excited. So it, it so happened that a friend of mine, Dave Hooper, led a, a church in Austin and the church had sort of migrated. It's called the donut effect from the city to the outskirts. And it was called the Austin church, but no one lived in Austin. Everybody lived in the suburbs. So he, he basically, he and I started talking and I, you know, was sharing my, my sort of, I felt called to do this. And he goes, well, you know, we don't have any money, but we really want to start this downtown thing. And, uh, and I said, well, I have a business actually. So maybe I don't need that much money, maybe pay me a little bit. And, uh, and, uh, and that's how it all ended up. Mm -hmm. So we planted this thing and we called tribe. And we called the tribe and we treated it as a church planting, not as a like a sectorizing or region. We did, basically treated it as a mission team going in, into the city and starting, starting a church. So that's how tribe was born. And uh, so I've been here basically ever since now, seven years now. We started tribe six years ago. Um, and it's been, it's been a great, it's a great journey. And uh, we, you know, we've never had a year that we haven't grown as a church, as a tribe. You every know, single year that's how we, we got planted to, a church we just we side of austin oh really so you planted a church within the city yes so uh, we send a mission team just like we started we sent a team of 30 people mm -hmm. to start a church on the east side of austin um so yeah so we're basically trying to rinse and repeat basically that's fantastic that's how we got to meet we met at the look up small church leaders conference last year and what impressed me is the entrepreneurial attitude that you have. In fact, in Googling, you, you, you look it up and, and you're listed as an entrepreneur, not as a church leader or anything else. Can you tell me about your mindset, you know, going in as an entrepreneur? Um, and, you know, there's a lot of guys that are thinking, hey, I'd like to do ministry, but maybe they're not going to be professional. They're not going to be paid, or maybe they, they want to go to a smaller area that they can't get the funding for. What would you tell them? Well, I would tell them that planting a church is social entrepreneurship by definition. That's what it is in its, in its essence. It just happens not to be a commercial entrepreneurship, but it's a social entrepreneurship. You have to be an entrepreneur if you want to plant a church. And basically what it means is you need to do something out of nothing. And it takes a special kind of person, you know, a special kind of crazy, I guess, you know? <laughs> Uh, to do that because it's there's so much uncertainty uh, associated with that. It's very very different when you know, especially when somebody says like we we you know the traditional way of of starting a mission team is a few churches sort of come together and they say look we're going to fund at least two years of this church's two years the salary for the key couple maybe some rent money whatever you know expenses a two years budget. Uh, and that's, I honestly think that model is, is in a, an ideal world would be fantastic. But if you think about it, what God wants is so much more than that. The numbers don't work. The numbers don't work. If, if you were to have that model as the only model. So I think we need to, maybe 20% of that and 80% self-starting bivocational entrepreneurial church planters to go out there and pursue what the Holy Spirit is, is putting on their hearts. Um, and it takes a lot of guts, you know, it takes a lot of hard work and tears and sweat, but it's fantastic. It's absolutely exhilarating. And it's part of the reason I loved the, uh, the small church conference, because there was, it's a room full of people like that. Right. Right. You exactly. know, just fearless, bold people. Right. Yeah. Now, you know, we're going through a, a time of huge, huge change, disruption in society around the world, not just in the States, but in every country because of the coronavirus. We're recording this right during this time. And it's one of the big reasons why I wanted to have you on, Christian, because I feel like you, um, not only are you a man of the world, you're a man of the times. You're, you are um, a leader in... Um, web production, and you've helped a lot of churches. I know a lot of people were helped by what you provided information with the, the company. Um, can you tell me a little bit about that? And uh, then we're going to just go into what you would advise during this time. 
Yeah, so we, we, when we started Tribe, we had a company, and at the time it was an entertainment company at first, it was, a, it was called Hollywood World, and it was music production and video production for entertainment specifically. And so it was in the music business, basically. It was, um, and then that company actually, and this is actually, might, probably speaks to that whole uncertainty and risk th factor, that as we were planting Tribe, that the marketplace that was very niche that we were serving, um, basically uh, dried up. So as I'm planting a church, mostly self-funded with a little bit of help from the Austin Christian Church, um, the bottom fell out. And I, we went into a two-year tailspin financially where I had the choice to whether drop the, the, the mission of planting the church and go, go get another, just a, a, a ministry job. I was, you know, I'm perfectly hireable. Let's put it that way. Right. You know, if I put, put the, my feelers out, I can probably get a job and go somewhere and get a salary. But I just didn't, I couldn't bring myself to do that because we, of what we had started. And so what it, it prompted was the, the, I was starting a church and, and a business in the same year from nothing. Um, it was just excruciating. Uh, <laughs> um, so that became a, a company called Third Drive. And it started off as a simple video marketing company for businesses locally. And now it's, it's really more of a boutique um, incubator for startups. Uh, we do a full range of marketing, uh, so everything from print, web design, branding, video, if, if, all of it. Like a, it's pretty full, pretty full service, and it's still boutique. It's fairly small because I want it that way. And then what happens is when we started Tribe, we started implementing some of these resources towards the church. So we rebranded, we did the logo, we did the website, we sort of innovated, innovated, innovated. This was six years ago, seven years ago, um, and um, we. It helped us so much with attendance and baptisms. Like so many people came just because of the website, just because they would look up two, three websites of a church and ours was better. It was that simple. It spoke to them on a different level and they just came. And now they're members, they were married in the church, leading small groups, you know, going on mission teams. But it started by someone making, getting a first impression online. So because we, we, um, we did this, um, after a while, we, we actually didn't serve any churches. We, um, I thought maybe we should roll it out to churches. And I really had not a lot of, I didn't have a lot of faith that churches would even pay. Mm -hmm. And we discounted it for churches and everything. Uh, but then I realized that the, uh, it's, it looked like the times have changed and people are realizing more and more that this is not a nice to have thing, but a must have thing. And uh, so we rolled out this, this sort of division called Third Drive Faith. And we basically do full rebranding, full marketing for churches, everything from like an, an overhaul, the whole overhaul. And we just create your video, your photo, your web, everything, and then just hand it over to you all the way to support, like ongoing support and creative work for every sermon series gets creative across the board. It's very integrated. And we've started doing that. Um, and th we started doing that about a year and a half ago, I think, something like that. When was the Panama, the big Panama conference? That was actually October 2018. Yeah, so it was, you know, that was the kickoff of Third Drive Faith. It was like I had a landing page and I started talking to church leaders. Um, and we have now rebranded a whole bunch of churches. We're now actually doing that for a, a Christian university uh, in Canada. And um, with this particular thing, because we've been doing this for now about a year or so, it's, fa it's fascinating how the COVID virus changed people's attitudes because it, it, it went from, yeah, that's, that's nice. Okay. Well, maybe we'll have an extra, we'll throw some money at this and you'll make it slightly better to a matter of, we need this for survival. Right. You know, mm -hmm. when, I mean, it's, it's never going to go. It's, it's a jump start of, of virtual church experiences. That's never going to go away. Right. I think. Well, and I, even I, after we go to normal life. It's funny. I, I got a phone call from a church leader in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and he was so thrilled because a, a year ago his church was struggling. He was, uh, you know, really wondering if it's if it's gonna if it's gonna go. The church had been around a long time, and he called me and said, "Man, you wouldn't believe it. I've got a new uh, web page, and because of the web outreach, um, a news organization contacted me about our Easter program. We had thirty-five people 
watching our Easter program where the average before was less than 100. And, uh, and I think he was using your services. So I, it's certainly impacting and it's, in, it's inspiring. We've got a lot of people listening that are, they're leading small churches. They're, they're, whether they're paid or non-paid, um, they're, you know, they're, their heads are spinning because of this coronavirus. All of a sudden, they're, they're wondering, how do I catch up technologically? I, I certainly myself have had some mini meltdowns trying to figure out how to live stream a service, how to put together a program. What advice would you give people that may not be super strong technologically, but want to catch up quickly, want to grow in this area? I would say, you know, adopt an entrepreneurial attitude. And the entrepreneur, basically, the difference between an entrepreneur and somebody who comes from like, let's say, the professional space of enterprise level stuff, is that someone who is used to the enterprise scale of things would never be flexible, inventive, and sort of guerrilla style enough. They, they just don't know how to do that. But people in startups, you know, they do. Like the CEO is also the CFO, is also the COO, you know, senior operating officer, senior financial officer, senior executive officer, and marketer all in one. Right. And that's the, that's, that's the way it is. And you know, like, and that's, I, I love this, the startup world and we work with startups. Um, we develop startups, we invest in startups now. And the, the, the cool thing about what I learned from that, that world is that there's this, there's idealism and passion to get things done. Mm -hmm. Okay. I need to get things done. I can't be par I don't, I can't afford to be paralyzed. I can't afford to be, you know, uh, in, in a fetal position in, in my home, just, you know, sucking on my thumb. Right. I need to get up and do something or I'll go under. It's a, that's the bottom line of, for any startup. Right. Um, so there's pivoting, there's flexibility that it's embedded in the DNA. And I think a church leader can adopt that. And you can, the way I got it is just by being super curious, right? right. Like I read, I, 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 I listened to pot, startup podcasts for years, just learning the DNA, learning how do they think, mm -hmm. you know, there's mark, great marketing books, you know, third drive, um, the, the, it was actually called after like a book that I read called third drive by Daniel Pink. Wow. You know, uh, it's I just devour books, just learn, learn right. from people. Right. And you're not going to get their skill set, but you'll learn some of it will, will stay with you. Right. And I think when, when you expand your, um, your, your mind a bit, it's going to help you be, have this tenacity, this, this anti-fragile quality that is absolutely required for a small church person and if you have that you have that you know that entrepreneurial zeal mm -hmm. you will get things done it could be you will do some some of it you'll find some volunteers you'll find a donor you'll hire us maybe right. even if you don't have the money you'll find a way to you know whatever it takes right, right. Uh, right. you'll put this thing together you'll make it happen but, and i think the enemy of that is is i don't know this this is not my thing i'm gonna i don't know this is just not my thing so you get paralyzed. Right. And when in the, in the startup world, you get paralyzed, you die. That's it. <laughs> I think it's, you, you cease to exist. You go get another job. Right. And I think that's, that's probably there's a value there in having mission teams and church plantings that don't have a safety net. Mm -hmm. Because you burn your ships. Right. If you burn your ships, you're going yep. to fight har harder. But if you're sent with a safety net and you go, well, you know, things don't go, we'll get another year budget from this big church that supports me. Right. That's not going to help you. I don't no, think. No, definitely yeah. not. Burn well, your ships. Burn the ships. That's right. Now, I'd like you to pull out your crystal ball here, Christian, a little bit. And obviously things have changed dramatically. And in time, we're going to go back to a more quote unquote normal life. But what, how do you envision life as a Christian or life in the church once we go back, let's say six months down the road, restrictions are off, uh, shelter at home is gone. What do you see as, as a permanent change going forward? Now, this isn't going to be held against you. What, what do you see as a permanent change as opposed to something where we're going to go back to business as usual? That's a good question. You know, I think... 
I think an, an increased awareness that media is the new sort of market square, you know, in Athens, right? Mm -hmm. It, it, it's the new Areopagus in Athens where people meet and this is where opinions are being formed. And if you, if you don't master it, you're being an apostle who stays in Jerusalem and doesn't hit the road, doesn't face danger. You're, you're a missionary who goes to the synagogue in a new city, maybe, and then does not leave the synagogue when you run out of the synagogue. You don't go to the marketplace. You don't go to the Areopagus. You don't change. You don't pivot. Right. And I think that's in media is that's the, that's media. It's the Roman roads of the first century. Mm. So I think there's a global shift that happened. That's never going to go away. You know, like three months ago, Rob, I would say 60 or 70 percent of the people I knew had no idea what Zoom is. Now my mother knows what Zoom is. <laughs> That's and right. Your mother probably, you know, and everybody's mother and grandma knows what Zoom is. Now people say we're Zooming. Right. This was just a matter of weeks. Right. You know, like the awareness and comfort level of, of streaming has, it's, you know, it's 70%. Social media activity is 70% up. That's amazing. It's insane. Yeah. It's really insane. That's not going to go away, right? Right, right. Well, you know, when people look at you, they... They see a guy, okay, was a pop star, had a number one hit in a, in a major country, one of the largest countries in the, in the world, uh, led a hope organization, a charity organization, led a church, did a startup. A person can feel overwhelmed like, oh my gosh, I'm never going to be that talented. I'm never going to develop those kind of skills. You clearly have developed a set of skills where you've stacked over time and have led you to this point with this attitude of entrepreneurialism that you've talked about. What skills, what what top three skills would you recommend a person that's like, okay, may not be there, but I want to get there. I want to be adaptable. I want to I want to make a difference with my life. What you've you've mentioned media skills. Mm -hmm. What other skills would you go, okay, you need to go after these if you're going to be relevant? and impacting going forward? That's a good question. Uh, you know, I know that people might think that, that what, you, what you just said, well, well, you're, this guy's this guy. Of course he can do all these things. But the truth is the ability to do the things that by the grace of God I've been able to do. And honestly, there's not a lot to write home about it relative everybody. There's always somebody infinitely more talented and, and accomplished than you are. So it's all a very, very relative world. But the, even some of the stuff that I've, I was, you know, by the grace of God, be able to do was born in hardship. Hmm. And that's what people usually the human human nature is like, you, it's much better to find an excuse why you're not moving forward to find I can do this in somebody else. Right. Look, I, I come from three generations of broken homes. Hmm. I've I was in a constant I was in a refugee camp at age five for fear of uh, my whole family was in fear for our lives, applying for asylum, who will take us uncertainty a hundred percent. You know, I've experienced poverty. I lived in a communal apartment in Moscow in the Soviet Union during the, during the Brezhnev years. I experienced in Africa, food rations, um, racism, all kinds of, you know, divorce of my parents, it's a lot of a lot of pain produces a lot of other qualities besides pain. Mm. Uh, you know, it produces curiosity. Like I'm a curious person. Why am I a curious person? Well, because I was forced to learn four languages by age nine. That's why. <laughs> you know. Uh, so um, what I'm saying is that don't let a good crisis go to waste. <laughs> right. right. This is a great opportunity for someone for for anyone to mobile mobilize yourself right uh, but i would say the the qualities i think my favorite qualities are in a person is curiosity mm -hmm. want to learn a learner spirit right um and the other one i would say is humility because you it sort of comes together with it because you you listen better when you're humble right you absorb mm -hmm. um and then culture i would say cultural flexibility that, that's probably another one and the reason for that one is because culture 
is everything is downstream from culture, quite frankly. Mm. So if you, if you don't, don't understand the fundamental shifts that are happening in, in, the, in the culture of, of where you live, and you can mask that as, well, this is the world. I don't want to be associated with the world, right? Um, you are going to miss the boat and you're going to be less effective and you're not going to be able to win as many as possible in the, in, in the words of Paul. And when he said that, win as many as possible, he was actually making a cultural flexibility statement. Mm. He was saying to the Jews, I'm like a Jew. To, mm. to the Gentiles, I'm like Gentile. And, he's, and at the same time, he's saying, I'm not bound by the law, but I will be to the Jews like a Jew. So he was making the distinction of not caving in to idolatry or to bad theology or, or wrong, you know, he's not abandoning God, but he's, he knows the culture, he loves the culture, and he speaks the language of the culture. Right. Now, that's something that you brought up a year ago when you spoke at the Small Church Leaders Conference, and you talked about being flexible when it came to culture and firm when it came to doctrine. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. And I, yes, yes, thank you. That's, that's what I love about the, the Apostle Paul. I've studied him a lot, and, and he is just a fascinating person to me because we, we have this guy in the Bible who is incredibly equipped for doctrinally, right? Uh, even before he became a Christian, he's incredibly equipped. He, he learned at the feet of, feet of Gamaliel, one of the top teachers in Jerusalem. He is the elite, the religious elite. He's learned. He has, he's way above the education level of, of the Galilean crew right. who preceded him. <laughs> right. you, know, you, you know, so he knows his stuff very, very well. So once the light came on, he realized Jesus is the Messiah. It all came together as, as a beautiful picture. And yet at the same time, in the same person, you see a person who grew up in Tarsus. And the, Tarsus is a Greek city. Mm. And he is the guy. Who, uh, uh, the same guy who, who uh, learned at the feet of Gamaliel in Jerusalem, he can say he is the only person in the Bible of the writers who, who gives sports analogies to illustrate his stuff. <laughs> well, that's not a Jewish thing. It's a Greek thing. Hmm. Hmm. He's using Greek culture to teach the Bible, right? When he goes to the Areopagus, uh, like a, a a group of very learned, probably arrogant people, sort of you know not really getting, not really giving him a warm welcome. He speaks with such eloquence and such cultural flexibility. You can study that that uh, that discourse as as a textbook of cultural flexibility. He doesn't mention the Old Testament not even once. He speaks about their gods. He speaks about their culture. He quotes their poets by memory. Mm. It's like quoting Jay-Z on a Sunday <laughs> sermon from That's memory. Right. Like, would that impress some people? Absolutely, that would impress some people, right? So what it, what it, what it, tell, what it tells those, those guys at the Areopagus, some of them, most of them basically didn't, didn't even get it, but some of them believe. That's what the Bible says. But I think the sum of them believed, I think, came because of his strength of he they were like listening going going, this is a guy speaking strange things. One God, we believe in many gods, he's Jewish, we're we're Greek, we're the elite, we're the intellectual sort of top of the world. Even the Romans want to be like us. Mm -hmm. But he knows us, he gets us. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm talking about. And I think a preacher, a church leader, needs to be able to speak to unchurched people right right in their city and they need to um, they need to have a feeling right? not even an intellectual understanding but a feeling that this guy this girl he knows me he knows my life he knows my values and yet he's calling me higher to rise above my limitations mm. with this bible thing right that's what i'm talking about yeah that's that's really it was very powerful when you shared that last year and I think it's a, a message that is super relevant and it's powerful coming from you, especially because you come from so many different places, so many different countries. I, I, it makes me wonder where, which country you really identify with the most from all the backgrounds you, you've experienced. 
Um, l- let me let me go go back here and, and talk about something. Um, what innovations are you seeing arising during this pandemic? What are you seeing as becoming interesting or you think, oh, that, that might be the next Facebook or that might be the next innovation that's going to really change our future? Is there anything that you spot that, that's catching your eye during this time? That is an excellent question. Um, you know, I think... You've mentioned I Zoom. Think we're, you what obviously... we're going to see is we're going to see, especially in, in the life of the church, we're going to see a coming together of the live and the in-person worlds hmm. much more tightly than before. Um, I believe that's going to be the case. And I think, I think we'll see a lot of integration um, happening. Um, like one of the things that we've de- we developed as, as a company, literally in a matter of a couple of weeks, is um, quarantine-ready websites. Um, and what we did is we basically used a lot of third-party integration to create websites where, you know, you have a strip where you can see, usually you, every, every church says, here's my staff, right? And maybe there's an email attached. Right. But this, our, our website that you can, you can click on it and it takes you to a calendar of that person with available windows and you can set up a Zoom appointment automatically and it goes wow. to your calendar and their calendar. Oh my gosh, that'd be handy, wouldn't it? It would be, yeah. So, and the idea for us, like I was, I was trying to think as a pastor, right? Okay, so I can't get to my people. How do I communicate to them? I'm here, I'm with you. Mm-hmm. How, you know, many of them don't even, like there's, there's a sort of several layers in, in any congregation, right? People that are with you all the time. There's right. people that are with you every once in a while. But there's this other, the whole gr- a larger group that I want to be able to have, have access to me, right? How do I communicate to them? I'm here. I'm in the middle of this together. Mm-hmm. You can always talk to me. Just press this button. Right. You know? uh, and, and so that's one of the things I think it's this integration of the digital and the in-person. Right. Uh, it's going to be tighter, uh, quicker. Right. And, and you know, that's, uh, that's really interesting. And it's the first time I've ever heard, ever heard anything like that. I, I know for, for me, looking at the church and, you know, using Zoom meetings and things like that, I thought, I don't think I'll ever go back to traditional meetings where everyone has to drive to a certain place and, you know, drive maybe 45 minutes to get to a meeting for an hour or two and then another 45 minutes back. It just doesn't make sense when you can meet for a half an hour and there's very little setup and boom, you're done and you've covered everything you need to. Uh, But there's some things that that probably can't be replaced. Um, Just seeing people face to face, obviously in person makes a huge, huge difference. You talked earlier, Christian, a little bit about your your midlife crisis. I think one of the challenges that that leaders face, people that want to grow, is growth is not linear. You, you don't just keep growing at a steady pace. Um, you, you said you went through a tough time. I'd like you to share about a time when you came back from a setback or a failure or a difficulty. And then what advice would you give people that are wrestling with challenges right now that are going, man, do I really have what it takes? Am I going to make it through this? I have quite a few f- story, stories of failure. <laughs> <laughs> so do I. <laughs> let, me, let me just pick one. <laughs> you know, um, I would say I would probably focus because it's more relevant to economic hardship and sort of the squeeze of a sudden cataclysmic sort of thing. You know, we when we, we came here and we planted the church and... Uh, we had a business that, you know, was doing okay, and um, we thought it was going to continue to do okay, and then it didn't. And the church here uh, that was supplementing our income couldn't really increase our pay at the time, uh, although they really wanted to. Um, and basically, the choice was, do you go get hired somebody, uh, which I somewhere else, which I could, but I it just couldn't, I just couldn't bring myself to do that. So, so that's, and that's the entrepreneurial thing is, is, do you just, okay, oh, this didn't, didn't work out. Let's move on and accept this. And always, I think there's a healthy way to accept, okay, you, this, is, this is not for me or this is probably not the time. Obviously, there's a place for this. But I think too often people get paralyzed and give up too early mm. rather than too late. And mm-hmm. the, um, in my mind, you know, I, what I did, I basically started a marketing company mm. called Third Drive. And a company was really an exaggeration at the time because <laughs> it, was, it was just me with a camera <laughs> you know it was a freelancer it's a glorified freelancer right 
uh, hiding behind a, a beautifully done website that I, I did myself personally, right? Mm-hmm. And I had some old work that I put there, some some of the stuff that I've done in video. And, um, you know, I basically started looking for, for work. And uh, I did Craig, Craigslist things and all kinds of little, you know, where freelancers find work. And, you know, I had this very interesting moment. I think it illustrates what I'm trying to tell you. Um, I, I was hired to do a shoot, uh, like some B-roll for like a, as like a videographer to, to for this a local politician of some sort who was vis- visiting. I think it was like a, it was not a big factory. It was like a small factory. They did like these metal signs that you, you see everywhere on the roads. That's what this little place did. So this local politician was supposed to come in and shake hands and kiss babies sort of, right? And it was sort of a PR thing. So I was told, hey, go over here. And it was in San Antonio. I had to drive to the, the, the next city over. So, you know, I grab my camera. I go, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to feed my family. Basically, right. You know? right. Um, we went into debt for two years slowly uh, while we were planting the church. That's how hard it was. So, so this is the very beginning of me trying to make it work. Right. So I'm, I'm sitting there um, waiting. Right. So then the the, the entourage comes in like three or four SUVs, black SUVs, and there's like seven, 10 people, you know, and there's, I basically get ushered over. Hey, you, hey, you like stand over there. Right. And over here, like I get basically treated like, uh, like the help. Right. Right. And I'm standing there, you know, and my thought was, I have entertained millions of people. Hmm. I've played for, sports arenas right and here i am how how, you know like i had this this moment i think in in front of god like in my mind and 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 how i was like how did i end up here i was just really feeling sorry for myself for a bit right um and and in that but then the the holy spirit told me any work is honorable Hmm. you're you're feeding your family you're starting a church. God is happy with you. Wow. And that's it. And then my mood changed and I was happy. I was joyful. I embraced it. I, I, there, there was peace in my heart, you know, and that's from those moments, you can build something, yeah. right? Because you find your, va- your true value in, in, in God and Jesus. And you allow the Holy Spirit to shape the way you think. Mm-hmm. Um, so it started by f- basic freelancing, right? Um, we now have seven or eight employees all over the world. It's f- it, we have a full set of services, web, print, video, video effects, rebranding, um, customer care people, CFO. Uh, we have invested in several companies. We have ownership in different startups. Um, this was just six years ago. That's amazing. That's and amazing. at this whole time, and, and I, I don't even know how that multiplies, right? Honestly, because it's so much work. And the ch- church has never stopped growing. Mm. Because partially, because I think partially because of this, because I am so busy trying to provide for my family as I'm, uh, you know, leading the church, that the church is aware that I love them and I, 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 I wouldn't leave, right? Mm. Um, but because of them, the, because of my sort of the needs that I have, right, mm. uh, to provide for my family, they need to step up. So that we have so much ownership in tribe where the tribe sort of runs itself, mm. right? I do a job, but there's so many people who take ownership of worship and, and kids kingdom and, and the board and sound and tech and all of these other things, social media, uh, that I just do, a, I'm just a team member. I'm not really the guy. Mm. And that's, it's a, it's a very curious byproduct of just trying to make it work coming from a significant, significant, uh, you know, crisis, right? It, right. It's, it's, it was two years of extreme financial hardship and, um, and, but somehow God carries you through these things. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's so interesting and inspiring at the same time. And I think, it, it leads to this next question. I want you to imagine that tomorrow you got an email and they said, can I, Hey, can I, can I add a quick story to please this? Please go ahead. So this is for those of you who are, 
who've hit a wall. Okay, so um, I'm just starting over. I'm starting over in the beginning of this journey of restarting, and um, um, I'm fasting. I fasted like a liquid fast uh, um, for 21 days. Two things happened at the end of that fast. One, uh, I'm behind uh, my rent. I'm, I'm behind for a full month of my family's budget. Mm, and I don't know when, how we're going to make it happen. And uh, I get a call from a guy, from a brother, who I have spoken once before. He said, hey, are you home by chance? I go, yeah. I'm like, yeah, not really talking to this guy, right? Uh, he's from a different part of the church and everything. He's like, can I swing by? Yeah, sure. So he comes, shows up, shows up with an envelope and says, God, told me to give you this. Wow. I said, what do you mean? He goes, God go, told me to give you this. I said, okay. Like, is there some sort of, you know, what, what are the terms? He goes, no, no, right. this is for you. And then he just leaves. I opened the envelope and that's exactly the amount. Oh my gosh. I, 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 I go into the laundry room. My, my wife, we were renting this little apartment uh, here in Austin and I tell her and she just cries, just oh. falls, just, you know. That's the power of sticking with it right yeah and the second thing that kept, came after the 21 day of fast was nasa hired me to consult for them and i was flown out to dc and i was doing a presentation in front of a, a boardroom and the windows of the of the presentation room that i was giving a, a presentation to a bunch of phds nasa rocket scientists i could see the the capitol dome right outside of that oh room. my gosh and all i could think of this is not me <laughs> so anyway this is just to illustrate sorry oh my gosh that's an incredible story oh man <clears throat> if if you received an email tomorrow christian and they said hey we want to put you in charge of god's kingdom here we've, we've had a slowdown in growth we'd like you to, to get things going again and get churches growing and and see our our rate of increase grow make a difference what what were the first couple things that you would do uh, on your list? What what would you go after first in order to get get churches growing around the world? Well, I, th I think it's above my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> if you had a magic wand and you could just make it any way you wanted. Oh my gosh. Uh I would say this, I would say if there's a magic, if there's, if there's a magical way for us as leaders to stop thinking ourselves about ourselves as things depend on us mm. and start thinking everything depends on God. But, and I think, and I know that every leader says that, you know, everything depends on God, but I don't think we act like that. Mm. You know, there's, there's too much of a desire to hold on to things. And because we, if you think at some level that things depend on you, that will keep you from praying and fasting mm. in, a, in a way as if nothing depends on you. Right. Yeah. So I think there's a shift there. It's almost like this, it's a down, the, almost like the downside of being a professional minister uh, because you can, it's baby steps, but you, you can grow into, become, into becoming a bureaucrat. Right. Oh, it's absolutely, absolutely. You know, and there's job security that you think of, and your the mortgage, and you know, I, and I think it's a de it's a deterrent to faith, to bold, you know, reckless faith. Right. You know, and I've talked to other leaders too, and it's interesting what what keeps coming up in response to that question. A lot of it is mindset. So so many of the responses are rather than practical, technical issues, more mindset, faith issues. Uh, what the what the leader thinks about himself really going after his his level of faith his personal opinion of himself in the eyes of god and and so that it's very um it, it definitely fits in with what other people are sharing as well Let, before we're gonna we're gonna wrap this up here in just a couple minutes but i want to ask you you know people around the world you, you know you're a highly connected people you your person you've been all, all over the place do you know anyone else who's really standing out, who's really growing, that that um, people should know about? Um, 
You mean in our family of churches? Can be in our family of churches or outside. Well, you know, I think we, many many of us are aware of just how in our family of churches that the churches, that Jakarta is this sort of shining light mm -hmm. of, like they, these people have been this, these churches have been growing exponentially for years. It's unbelievable. Right. It's unbelievable. Um, but you know, I am part of this. Um, there's life outside of the ICOC, let's put it that way, right? And I think it's important for us to know that. And we need more people to realize that we have so much to learn from other people, from other streams of Christianity, and even right. sort of our, our, our sort of church cousins, right? I, am, um, I'm, I was honored to be asked to be like a co-founding partner in, a, in a, almost like this, this network of churches called Renew some time ago and it's basically three mostly three it's a christian churches uh, uh, mainland church of christ and icoc people so theologically a lot of those those streams are very similar mm -hmm. uh, which really helps but the, really the people don't talk to each other so we we started this network and you can find it on renew.org um and um i've been sort of in the I was in the in the in the prep to, to launch in a soft launch sort of phase. So I would travel to Nashville and I would hang out with these guys. So I've built relationships and friendship, actually really good friendships. Um, and um, what I've learned is that there are people, there are people there that would that would humble me. Like mm -hmm. just like there's this guy in in Sierra Leone. His name's Shadanke Johnson. And you know, I, when I speak to him, he starts dozens of churches every year. Mm. Like we're, he's, we're talking, he has prayer, prayer chains of 11,000 people. Uh, it's the things that, that God is doing, in, especially in the global south, will blow you away. Right, right. You know, and, and, when, and it's almost like it's, it's, it's almost like, really? Are you sure? Is this <laughs> maybe hype? You know? Right. But I've but I've have friends who have gone there and who have gone to those churches and met those church planters, and it's 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 a wave. It's it's unbelievable, right? So, and we might not even be super aligned in everything theologically, but really, you don't. There's nothing to learn, really. Right. right. Like when you see tens of thousands of people believing in Jesus, you there's nothing to learn. Are right. you sure? And right. you know, it's, it's one of those things that just you know, baffles me that right. why we can't, why can't we be curious? Right. Absolutely. You can learn from so, so many different talk, people. When I, when I talk to Shadanke, you know, I've had lunch with him and, and, and this is a guy who is just, it, he feels like a prophet to me. Like he just says, I don't know if God's going to do anything here, but we're going to pray until we find out. Right. Like he's that kind of guy. Right. He's that guy. Uh, yeah. the, his faith is, is infectious. Right. And I've met m people like that overseas here in the U.S., um, there's God is up to many, many things outside of what we see with our own eyes and Absolutely. our own experiences and networks. Absolutely. Christian, thank you so much for your time on the podcast today. If someone wanted to contact you, get more information, learn from you, where would they go? You can just Google Christian Ray Flores and find sort of, a, 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 you know, a stuff. You can go to third drive, third to drive .co. Um, thirddrive.co slash churches. There's sort of that segment for churches. Uh, and you can find me on social media quite, quite easily, Facebook, Instagram, you know, places like that. Right. Well, thank you so much for coming, coming on the program today and best of luck to you in Austin and your work going forward. Thank you, my friend. Thanks for inviting me. I, I want to say thank you for listening to the Rob Skinner podcast today. My goal is to inspire you to make this life count, multiply disciples, leaders, and churches. If you enjoyed this program, I'd like to ask you to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast, and I'll include information about Christian Ray Flores in the description below. Thanks again, and make this life count.